For Krima Media's Polity, I'm Sane Lamini, former Umklabowe Nene presenter and former PRO for Kaiser Chiefs, Pat Komafani, joins me to discuss his biography titled Pat Komafani, The Price and the Prize of Greatness. So we know Pat Komafani as the former Amakosi Oktula Nautolo spokesman, and you've also been with Umshobo Nene as a radio presenter. Can you briefly give us some insights into where you grew up? Well, I was born and uh, grew up in a small town called Fort Beaufort, a Bofolo, in the province of the Eastern Cape. Small as it is, it's got very big educational institutions and that are historic like the Hilltown High School, for instance, which uh, the late Nelson Mandela went to when he was a boy. And 10 minutes on the uh, eastern side, being the University of Forte. Oh, Mr. Mafani also grew up in a very big, if I may say, but also a loving and warm family, despite not having your father present in your life. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, well, I think like many, many black young people in South Africa who, who find themselves being grown up by grandmother and grandfather, they, they think it's their actual biological parents. And whereas the one they perceive to be a big sister or big uh, a sibling, only to find out it is the actual biological mother. It's the real mother. It's, an, it's not a unique story in South Africa. And the author of the book is also from such a setup, being grown by grandparents because um, they, the real mother actually had my sister, her firstborn, I think when she was 16 years, and had uh, her second born, uh, and then when she was like 20 years and then had me when she was 24, but she still was a dependent. She, she was still at home, you know. And then after she had me, then she got married to the Mathanyana family and, and I joined along, but I was, I was quite lucky because I was surrounded with lots of father figures that I did not even bother to ask those questions about what's going on. I see, I see this one has a father, but who's my real father? But those, those questions did not dominate what made my typical day schedule and even nighttime. I was not bothered by that. I was surrounded by lots of love. Until later in life, when I was like 30 years old or so, you know, in my early 30s, when I said, I'm an, let me find out, in fact, about... Uh, where's my old man, you know, and what's happening to my old man? And, and, and sadly, um, when I then discovered where he was, uh, it is uh, when, unfortunately, he had just died. Uh, but I was determined that I would even attend his funeral, even if I see him sleeping in that cold, still and quiet coffin and, and so that's what I did. I went to a, a place called Mount Alif in the northern parts of Trans Sky uh, the, that's bordering KZN and Eastern Cape and went to Mount Alif uh, to attend his funeral. You know, I drove alone. I was already working in Jobek by then. I was already on television. I was already on radio and I drove alone. And when I got the people who were seeing someone they know from TV shows, Cosmo Life and all of that, and Dinda Baza's close on TV, they didn't know that I've come to bury somebody that I've been longing to see for a bit of a while, you know. And, and when I heard tributes about him, they were saying a lot of great things. What a great man he was. I was like, wow. So the best he invested in me was through his genes. I missed out on his voice. I missed out on his teachings, his admonishing, his, his disciplining, and uh, his inspiration, his motivation, his encouragement. I missed out on all of those, you know. And that's why sometimes I say, maybe if I had an opportunity with him, I could have, I could have halved the mistakes I've made in my life. 
And maybe if I had an opportunity with him, I could have even doubled the little bit of success that I've seen in my life. But well, there is nothing that is in the blind spot with God. God saw it like this and he left it like that so that I may tell my story to inspire another young person who also doesn't know their father. You also had an, an amazing time, if I may say so, at Bethel. Now, when you went to school there, the induction but was kind of, of sharpening for your radio skills in a way. Yeah, well, you know, Bethel College, like most boarding schools, they will always have this induction with newcomers. You know, they will do some of some of those things are, are crazy and funny. And, uh, and and some of them can be harsh, hey? And and so when I go to school, I used to jokefully pretend like I was a broadcaster during the very early years at boarding school. So what they did then in the induction, they would lock me in the cupboards and they would say, okay, let's listen to the news, gentlemen, quiet. We're going to switch on our radio. And then they would they would pretend like they're switching on a radio. And there I would go. There, there I would go. I would I would hoy the news bulletin and sports. And and I would even broadcast or commentate a soccer match. And all along, while they thought that they were inducting me, they were sharpening my dream. By the time I got on radio, I needed less training. <laughs> And yeah. growing up, you were a bit naughty as well, but you also took your school duties, which I like, very serious. Can you tell us uh, how becoming a bell ringer contributed to your leadership skills as well as discipline? Well, that, that, was, that was very interesting because being a timekeeper for the entire boarding school is a huge responsibility. It's a huge responsibility. And I was given this responsibility. The interesting thing, and this is the irony of ironies, and this is where you see the price and the prize of greatness. The prize is that I'm being awarded this huge responsibility to run the entire school's program by being a bell ringer, running ahead of everybody, you know, have to wake up before everybody wakes up so I could ring the rising bell, have to ring the bell for the morning assembly, the prayer meeting, have to ring the bell for breakfast, have to ring the bell for the first period and everything. And during the periods in class, I walk out while the teacher is teaching. As long as the time is over, I don't even ask for permission. I take my books, I walk out. It means I've got the authority to walk out and not, not even ask uh, you know, from the teacher because I've, I've got to go ring the bell. You know, Now that carries a lot of responsibility, but the price that I had to pay was the fact that from a vulnerability point of view, I found myself with a biological defect, with, with a medical defect. And that was, what, that was that one of bad wetting. And when this happens, remember, when this happens, it interferes with a child's self-esteem. And when the other boys leave the dormitory, you know, after I've gone to ring the bell, then I have to come back. When, when, when I ring the bell for the assembly, then I have to run back again to the dormitory to take my mattress out, to see that nobody's seeing me and take my mattress out. And this is happening, you, for many years, three to five years at boarding school. And it potentially, it could have eroded my self-esteem, but God was gracious enough for me because it was balancing my life on one hand, I have this responsibility to run the school's schedule. It has a sense of authority. I'm the bell ringer. On the other hand, there is this defect that I'm dealing with. So from an, on an equilibrium basis, I am fine. It's like having one foot on ice cold bucket with cold water with full with ice or having another foot on hot coals. And on average, I'm fine. And it was, it was also interesting to read that you were involved in politics. You even went to jail. Can you tell us how you were politicized and why you were arrested? When I was at Radio C Sky, um, I was consciously aware. I think because dating back 
to the 1976-1977 Soweto uprisings. Well, they are called Soweto uprisings, but they were South African schools uprisings. From Soweto to Wamashu, to Kukuleitu, to Libuahom, to, uh, to Bloemfontein, to, to everywhere, to Kimberley, the whole South Africa was mobilized, the youth was mobilized in fighting against being instructed in Afrikaans, where they were teaching us mathematics as veskende, teaching us agriculture as landborn. It made the, difficult, the subjects even more difficult. So I was already conscientized politically. By the time I got read to Radio Sky, and this is the time when um, the, the political organizations had just been unbanned. Nelson Mandela and all of them were released from prison. And those that were in exile were returning from exile. And we knew that freedom had come. And, and, and I was part of the Association of Democratic Journalists you know, that, 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 that were struggling for fairness in terms of journalists and the freedom of expression. Um, and then, then there was a man that was called Brigadier Oba Joshua Gozo, who just like General Bantu Olomisa had overturned a Bandustan government and took over the leadership and the government. But now this man Gozo, unlike Olomisa, started working against you know, um, the, the organizations that had liberated black people, your PAC, your ANC, your Azapo, you name them. He started working against them. And he started forming his own party and, 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 and you know, issuing instructions to the radio station that we must stop talking about those organizations. I refused that. And I defied his orders and I carried on, you know, talking about Mandela, talking about Sisulu, talking about Chris Ani, talking about Oliver Tambo and the meetings that they were holding all over South Africa and I was detained. So he detained me for two weeks in solitary confinement. I was not entitled to doctor's visits or lawyers or family or anything for two weeks. I just sat there. And the only thing I was looking forward to was the sound of the keys. When you are in, in, a, in a police cell or prison, there is nothing that sounds good as the sound of the keys when they open the door because they spark some kind of hope that maybe I'm going home, you know? So, so yes, I did go through that. Um, I don't think I, re I regret anything. I, I have no regrets. It happened, it probably had to happen so that my story can inspire someone or my story can be a warning to people that are in power, never to abuse their power. And we can't talk to you and then neglect your work at Kaiser, at Kaiser Chiefs as the spokesman. 1999 must have been one of your best years in life when you were headhunted to join one of the biggest brands in, in the country. You had big shoes to fill though, I remember, because the previous spokesperson was also like a great man. Can you tell us about your dream job? The winter of 1999, I was working at Kaya FM as a sports editor. And I also doubled up with the SABC for presenting in the Zestosa in the evenings, uh, the 7.30 news bulletin. And that's where at the SABC, I met uh, the financial director at Kaza Chiefs. His name is uh, Hamid Mohamed. Uh, and, and he told me, he told me that Kaiser Mutawung was looking for me. I said, what? He said, yes, Kaiser was talking about you recently in a board meeting. Oh yes, I need to mention this. Before I go to Kaya FM, I was at Reebok. And at Reebok, part of my responsibility at Reebok, I was managing the Kaiser Chiefs account, sponsorship account, seeing to it that Kaiser Chiefs had their sponsor. Now, Reebok used to be the apparel and footwear sponsors for Kaiser Chiefs, servicing that relationship, you know. And I think Kaiser might have noticed it from there because I was handling um, Kaiser Chiefs and the Natal Sharks. And, and um, then when I heard that he was looking for me, I couldn't believe it, that a man of Kaiser Dawun's caliber 
is looking for me to work with him, to join his team, his big movement. And, and, and as I arrived at Casa Chiefs, I was not even bothered about how much I would be earning because what was important for me was this opportunity. The opportunity presented to me was much more exciting, even more beyond, way beyond, you know, being worried about what the package would be. You know, so then I, I joined and I hit the ground running because we were preparing for the very first Vodacom challenge, which was an off-season tournament played in July. So that very first month, I started traveling around, going for meetings and going to the games of the Vodacom challenge in Pretoria and in Deben. And um, I started also uh, calling for supporters meetings, the supporters, the, the supporter branch executives calling them into meetings. And so this, this was undoubtedly one of the biggest opportunities ever in my life. Your mom also played a huge role in raising you as she was also a single parent. I was, I was so touched when, when I saw you pinning a rose in her dress during your graduation at Bethel. Can you tell us a bit about your mom? My mom has always and is even now the biggest thing ever to happen to me, she gave me all the love when my father was not there. And um, I could feel her struggles when I was at boarding school because this was not just a government public boarding school. It was a private boarding school run by a church. So it didn't get any amount of government subsidy in running its affairs. Um, Bethel College is a private school that's run by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And, and so therefore, being in a school like that meant that the school fees were quite higher than school fees back in the township. Um, and you had boarding as well. And so some of the parents really struggled and, and my mother not being assisted by anyone because she was just a nurse, an assistant nurse, and she would battle. I admire her. Sometimes, towards the end of the year, those whose school fees were, were behind would be sent home. And, and you would be sent home. And you come back only if um, your parent has paid. I remember I did stand at nine twice because in 1981, when I was sent home uh, doing my stand at nine, which is grade 11 now, it was critically at a time when others were doing revision for the final exams. And it took longer for me being at home while my mom was raising funds. I never failed a class because one, I was not able or I was uh, uh, not a smart kid or I was lazy, no. But I happened to have repeated a class. And I want you know young people that are watching this interview, to repeat a class is not a stigma. To repeat a class means that um, whatever made you to fail a class, you've given a second opportunity. I believe in a life of second opportunities. And it doesn't, have, it doesn't matter what happened to you. Even if you want, went through a divorce, there's always a second opportunity. Even if you want made a big mistake like aborting a child or, or, or whatever, it's not the end of the world. We have to recover and triumph over all social ills, a combination of social ills of, of, our, of our vulnerability and social ills made sometimes from the mistakes, our own mistakes and our parents' mistakes. We all have a duty to inspire somebody to overcome, rise above. My book is a book to say, if I rose above all the challenges that are narrated in the book, that someone also can and should rise above. How would you comment on how you had the Ellis Park massacre? Looking back now, on the on, on what happened that day. Well, the Ellis the Ellis Park was more of a disaster, um, uh, which which something that we we could not foresee, you know, and that is why even the commission of inquiry that looked at the happenings of the Ellis Park disaster did not charge anybody for, for reckless whatever. It had to do with the plans. Um, our plans were Soweto Derby 
had always been played even on Wednesdays in the evenings. So one of the lessons learned out of that was that the Soweto Derby must never play in the evening and during the week. It must now, now that we've seen 43 people sadly losing their lives, and 43 is a big number. And, and, and now that we've seen that people have lost their lives, we've got to introduce new systems. And we did that. And one must remember that during Kaiser Chiefs home games, I would be the MC at the stadium. And on that fateful night of the 11th of April 2001, I had a microphone in my hand because I always would be introducing the team's lineup and all of those things and welcoming the supporters, introducing the entertainers, the artists and dancing with them and having fun. But most importantly, welcoming the branches that have traveled from all over South Africa because they know that I have traveled to the towns and cities around South Africa opening those branches. So by then they were used to my voice. So when calamity was striking, when, when the disaster started to happen, when we saw people carried on to the field in the northeastern corner of the stadium, and when I ran what's happening, um, I discovered that no man, these are no longer people carried into the stadium. These are actually bodies. These are bodies of dead people. And seeing this together with my colleague, Amy Casaletti, and the late Zodwa Koza, we immediately discussed this amongst themselves that, you know what, we've got to talk to the fourth official and the match official, I mean, the, the match commissioner, so that the referee stops the game. And at some stage, they didn't understand. They, they were getting stubborn. We told them people are dying. This game has to stop. So finally, they listened, they relented, and the game stopped. And I grabbed the microphone. And at that time, there was no time to consult with my bosses. There was no time to consult with the chairperson of the league, Dr. Ivan Koza. There was no time to consult with the CEO of the league. There was no time to consult with the Minister of Sport, Monde Balfour. That time, I just needed to run with the responsibility to calm the people that are anxious because Kaiser Chiefs had just stepped, scored first through Tony Ilodigwe a striker we had signed from Nigeria. And Orlando Paris had just equalized through Benedict Villagas. And so this, these quick goals, early goals, they made even the people that were outside the stadium to panic because people had access even to, and I hate this term, even, even they had access to, to tickets from the black market, Hong Kong counterfeit tickets, which I don't know where they were printed. And people had been sold those tickets unscrupulously outside in a notorious way. And those people were pushing into the stadium. They could hear from outside that one team has scored. They could also hear from outside that another team has scored again, and they were growing impatient. But when I spoke to them, and I must say, you know, God has a, mo has a man for every moment. And I'm, and I'm humbled that on that fateful night, I was the one that was appointed by God to restore order and speak peace and speak assurance and speak safety and speak future to people that did not see future because 43 bodies were lying on the field, you know. So it is one of those things that I consider myself extremely lucky. And I think, I think also the experience from radio and television worked in my favor because I needed to, to, to speak as I walk, write the script as I speak, because there is no moment to write a script and go through it. You write as you speak, you think as you speak. And that experience I had gotten from uh, electronic media, as I say. And uh, yeah, look, the rest is history. I'm sad that we lost 43 people. And we had more than a hundred others that were injured. What are, what are you up to now? Because we don't know anything about you. What, what, what are you doing and what's that for Patco? Well, I have my own agency now, uh, the Patco Mafani Consulting. It consults on public relations. It consults on uh, events management. 
uh, branding, uh, you know, those kind of things. I am now, you know, doing uh, some work for Rebosis, uh, which is a company that owns shopping centers in uh, in Gauteng and the Eastern Cape. Um, three shopping centers, Pretoria, uh, Forest Hills Shopping Mall, Sunnyside Park Mall, Blood Street Mall, and two shopping centers in the Eastern Cape in East London, Hemingways, and in Port Elizabeth, Bay West. So I'm consulting now with Rebosis to try and market those shopping centers. It's a new environment, but I am loving the challenges that come with it, you know. And uh, yeah, so um, I see there's a lot of exciting developments in football. If an opportunity would come my way, I love football. It would be a question of Tumami. That was Pat Komafani speaking to Krima Media's Polity about his biography titled The Price and the Prize of Greatness.